The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book 2 North or Be Eaten. Chapter 32 Raunchy McHiggins Makes a Discovery. The Fangs had learned by now not to give Poto Helmer time to think. They rushed forward, their swords trained on Poto and only Poto. Janner heaved the pile of crates into their path. The fangs batted and hacked the crates away and pushed forward. Janner was certain Poto would leap into the fray and fight to his death rather than allow the fangs to capture his grandchildren. And leap he did, but not at the fangs. Poto slammed his shoulder into the thick side door of the roundish widow. The door broke into pieces and the sound of splintering wood mingled with the sound of splintering bone as Poto's shoulder and ribs cracked. He tumbled to the floor with a cry of pain, but in one motion he rolled over, grabbed the nearest backpack, which happened to be his own, and disappeared into the tavern, cursing Miglanders all the while. Naya swept Lily into her arms and rushed through the door after him. Go! Janner screamed at Oscar. He jiggled through the doorway, sweeping up the boys' backpacks as he went. Janner grabbed Tink by the arm and rushed through the door, skidding on bits of broken wood. Claws scraped at his back and legs. He heard the clacking of fang teeth and the squeak of fang armor and felt the heat of fang breath on his neck. Janner knew Nag still wanted the children alive because it would have been an easy thing in that moment for the fangs to run him and his brother through. But in their scramble to seize the boys, the beast slammed into the doorway as one and jammed. Janner crashed into a table and nearly fell. As he ran, he strained to see where the rest of his family had gone, but the tavern was pitch black. All he knew was that he was still had Tink's elbow in his grip. It took the Fangs little time to regroup and enter the tavern in single file, but by then Janner had felt his way through a swinging door and into the common room of the tavern. Two large windows that looked out on Riverside Road faintly illuminated the tables and chairs spaced throughout the room. Janner heard his family somewhere ahead and the Fangs behind. Mama, he cried. Grandpa, here, Naya answered, just as Poto kicked open the front door and the others darted out to the street. Come on, Janner said to Tink. But the brothers never made it to the door. From the street came the sound of battle. Poto appeared beyond the doorway, a white-haired terror swinging his sword even as he hugged his wounded side with his other arm. The shadows of the battle stretched long across the room. Janner saw with black dread that Fang surrounded his grandfather. He and Tink were stuck. If they ran outside, they'd find themselves in the thick of the fight, and they had no weapons. Oscar had their packs. Behind them, more Fangs poured into the house. Janner could see the outline of his little brother's face, the glint of his wide, frightened eyes looking to Janner for help. But he didn't know how to help. He was only 12. How was he supposed to know what a throne warden would do? He wanted to ask Poto, or Pete, or Naya, or Esben. Then came Poto's voice from outside, sputtered between parries and thrusts of his sword. Get back to the burrow! Boys, meet at the burrow! Poto's voice cut short, but another familiar voice joined it. Aha! Doubt smelly snakish boots! Beware the steely shine of the florid swords, er, sword! Outside the window, the caped figure leapt into the fight. With one hand, he swung his sword with frightening speed, with the other rested casually on his hip. The cluster of fangs attacking Poto turned as one and rushed the man in black. The swinging door behind the boys crashed open and fangs poured into the shadowy common room. The only thing Janner could think to do was duck. He and Tink scrambled under a table and crawled to the farthest corner of the room. The fangs sped toward the open front door, crashing through tables and chairs as they ran. Janner and Tink, on hands and knees, held their breath and watched the scaly legs of at least thirty fangs rush past. And now I need, must needs flee, said the florid sword, for thy numbers art full of bigness. Aha! The clash of swords ceased. Janner listened for Poto's voice, for Lily's scream, for any sign of his family. But he heard nothing except the mutter and moan of tired and wounded fangs. Gone, said one of the fangs. Yes, sir. It was the florid. Don't say his name. Aye, sir. Well, he came and we got distracted from the old man. He's a good fighter, he is. 
for a one-legged fella took down seven of me fangs and wounded five others besides. And the fat one, he just grabbed a sword and spun in circles so fast we thought he might up and float away. Tried to get past him to grab the girl, but before we could, as I said, sir, we had him till the floor er, till he showed up. Lost him again, then, said the leader as they moved away. Crack won't be happy. Crack's never happy, sir. Janner and Tink looked at each other in the darkness. They got away, Tink whispered. I hope so, Janner said. But what about us? I don't know. What will we do? I don't know. Long after the last fang disappeared, the brothers hid under the table and held tight to each other, more alone than they had ever been. Raunchy McHiggins wasn't a bad man, though he enjoyed his life among the vigilantes and thieves of Dugtown. He enjoyed the stories, the excitement, the way one never knew who might walk through the front door of the tavern with a tale to tell and stolen coins to spend on a plate of sailor's pie. Raunchy didn't talk much. Unlike the other tavern owners who prattled on about problems and rumors and the way this customer jilted him four years ago or that fangs shattered a window just for the laugh of it, Raunchy McHiggins listened. He paid attention. That was why Gammon liked him. Gammon knew Raunchy could tell him what was happening in Dugtown, from the construction of more torch towers to the discovery of another strander tunnel to the movements of fangs from one district to another. So when Raunchy heard word from Glipwood, from a pair of ridge runners, that some Anarian heirs, children from the sound of it, were on the run in Glipwood Forest, he resolved to tell Gammon about it when next he saw him. Gammon came to Dugtown every few months to check in with Raunchy, and who knew how many other members of his secret force scattered throughout Torboro and Dugtown. He looked different every time he came. A master of camouflage he was, and a master of deceit. How else could he have survived these many years, gathering weapons, mustering fellow rebels, and amassing an army in the ice prairies that might someday overthrow the fangs and banish them from Scree forever? Gammon was a clever one, all right, or he'd have been found out like all the other fools who dared to defy Nag the Nameless and his fangs of Dang. Only days before, Gammon had appeared in the roundish widow, hobbling like an old man and filthy as a cave blat. It was such a convincing disguise that Raunchy had twice batted him with a broom in an attempt to shoo him from the tavern before he realized whom he was whacking. If only Gammon had come three days later, then Raunchy would have known what to do about fat Oscar and Retip showing up for the first time in ages, wanting to smuggle three children and their, and their guardians to the ice prairies. Raunchy knew immediately these children had to be the rumored Anarian heirs. It was no secret that Retip was from Glipwood and believed the tales about the distant isle, the Shining Isle, it was called in stories. What was Raunchy to do but help? How was he to know Miglanders was as rotten as he smelled? If only Gammon had been there, he would have told Raunchy what to do. Likely, Gammon himself would have smuggled them north. Now everything was a mess. The tavern was a mess, and his alleyway door was broken to bits. The children had been so young, their features so fine, their eyes so hopeful when they looked at him. An old Retip, probably dead now or bleeding in a dungeon. This was what he got for trying to help. Raunchy still wore his nightgown and cap. He hadn't slept a wink the night before. He had locked and barred the alley door, trudged upstairs and into bed, and put Retip and the rest out of his mind. Until he heard the awful scream. The old pirate called Landers a traitor, then came a crash, then the sound of his beloved tavern being wrecked. Rather than facing the mess in the dark, Raunchy had lain in bed all night, dreading what he would find in the morning. At the first hint of dawn, he came downstairs with a heavy heart, wondering what had become of Reteep, his friends, and the children. He swept what was left of his back door into a dustbin and tossed the debris into the alley, then pushed through the swinging door and into the common room. He took stock of the windows, none broken, which was a nice surprise. The front door, open but intact, thank the maker. And a wreck of tables and chairs, seven broken chairs, three broken tables. With a heavy sigh, Raunchy righted the fallen tables and scooted chairs under them. 
In a few hours, his first customers would wander in, and they would want a place to sit. The less they knew about his involvement with last night's events, the better. Raunchy found them in the back corner of the room, two boys asleep in each other's arms. Their faces were filthy, streaked with either tears or sweat, the smaller one's head resting on the older one's chest. It was such an unexpected thing to discover that Raunchy McKiggins stood over them for a long time, unwilling to disturb such a simple, beautiful thing. The dawn sang through the windows in fat golden beams, and to his great confusion, tears arose from somewhere deep within him and streamed down his face. He decided to help them. <laughs>